January 2014, Karen Rodriguez was brutally kidnapped and murdered. Her mother, Miriam Rodriguez, purchased a pistol, changed her appearance, and transformed into this modern-day Sherlock Holmes, tracking down every one of her daughter's kidnappers. What happened next? Well, get ready to delve into the stories of these five parents who revenged their kids' cartel kidnappings. Number 5. Eduardo Gallo Eduardo refused to let his daughter's brutal kidnapping and slaying become just another forgotten case, so he would solve it himself, right up to the arrest of his daughter's killer. July 2000, Paola Gallo was chilling with her friends at her parents' weekend home when a group of attackers recklessly stormed in. They jumped over the fence, barged into the house, and terrorized everyone for two hours. They wouldn't only steal jewelry and cash, but also kidnap Paola and two cars. This incident was just one of many kidnappings plaguing Tepetzlan, Mexico at the time. And like countless other families in Mexico who had fallen victims to kidnappings, Gallo paid a hefty ransom of around $18,500, along with some jewelry, to the cartel members who had taken his daughter. However, a week later, Paola's lifeless body was discovered. She'd been mercilessly shot twice, once in the neck and once in the back. At her funeral, Gallo, with tears streaming down his face, poured out his love for his beloved child. He said, I'll always love you, my adored child. Thank you for your smile and your caress. Thank you for your souls, your happiness, and your love of life. You always lit the path so I could distinguish between justice and vengeance. The pain Gallo felt was beyond words. He knew that his daughter's final moments must have been filled with sheer terror. And even though three suspects were quickly caught, the actual person who pulled the trigger and took her life was still on the loose. Driven by an overwhelming desire for justice, Gallo made a decision. He would close down his consulting firm and transform into a relentless detective, determined to find the killer on his own. Over the next year, Gallo tirelessly followed leads on the street and carefully examined phone records. His research uncovered a shocking fact. A staggering 90% of kidnappings in Mexico go unreported. This happens because the closest to the victims are often paralyzed with fear, terrified of the brutal consequences that may follow. But Gallo wasn't afraid, and he was determined to avenge his daughter's kidnapping and murderer at all costs. And his determination did pay off in the end. Paola's father not only identified the main gunman, but also assisted the authorities in tracking him down. Gallo managed to trace the shooter to a payphone he used. The police then set up a stakeout, which led to the arrest of a 28-year-old man named Francisco Zamora Arellano. He eventually confessed to killing Paola. After the case was closed, Morelos State Police Chief Jose Augustine Montiel said about Gallo, this man, with great bravery, set aside all his affairs and carried out the entire investigation. Sadly, Mexico is a country plagued by kidnappings. Believe it or not, this problem extends beyond innocent civilians, reaching even those on top of the food chain, the drug lords themselves. Number 4. El Chapo August 15, 2016, just before 1 a.m., a gang of seven armed men barged into an upscale restaurant on the main street of Puerto Vallarta, a popular beach spot in Mexico. Inside this fancy restaurant, two rich Mexican brothers were having dinner with their friends, all jazzed up to celebrate one of their birthdays. They were sipping on champagne and the whole place was lit up with candles. But then out of nowhere, six heavily armed individuals with machine guns surrounded them. The gunman forced the brothers to their knees, disarmed them, and then took them out of the restaurant and shoved them into two waiting SUVs. The operation was brutal and quick, taking less than two minutes. The restaurant's owner would later describe it as violent but very clean. Those two brothers that had been kidnapped were none other than Jesus Alfredo Guzman and Ivan Archivaldo Guzman, the sons of the infamous El Chapo. Yeah, you heard that right. And you might be thinking, who would kidnap the sons of a guy whose name alone sends shivers down anyone's spine? Well, perhaps an even tougher man, who saw an opportunity and took it. January 8, 2016, El Chapo was captured in Los Mochis, Sinaloa, after a fierce shootout with Mexican Marines. 
This was his third arrest, and everyone believed the extradition of the U.S. was almost certain, making it highly unlikely for him to escape for a third time. This kidnapping was seen as a major setback for the Elder Guzman's attempts to maintain the Sinaloa cartel's dominance in the region from behind bars. The emerging rival, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or CJNG, posed a significant challenge to his power. Sources later showed that the kidnapping incident served as a grand entrance for El Mencho, the leader of the ruthless CJNG. He wanted to send a clear message to the Sinaloa cartel and its associates. Your king is now locked up, so don't think you're untouchable. It was also meant as a warning. El Mencho was coming for the throne. In 2010, El Mencho established the cartel and quickly transformed it into one of the largest criminal organizations in the country, and also one of the deadliest. Initially, this cartel had close ties with the Sinaloa cartel, but after Chapo's arrest, it began taking possession of some of the Sinaloa cartel's territories. Now, let's go back to the burning question. Was El Chapo just going to sit back and let his sons become collateral damage in this new turf war? Well, you can probably guess that answer. Even while locked up, El Chapo was ready to cause chaos and mayhem on the streets of Mexico. But fearing a full-blown war, El Mayo Zambada, a longtime ally of El Chapo and one of his few surviving veteran drug lords from the Sinaloa cartel, decided to step in. Rumor had it that he took charge of the negotiations that dragged on for a whole week. According to a source from the DEA, the leader of the CJNG had initially planned to kidnap and kill the brothers. However, at the 11th hour, El Chapo's threats and El Mayo's relentless bargaining managed to secure their release. And what did it cost? A $2 million ransom and a whole lot of drugs. But El Chapo wouldn't be the only drug lord today willing to go to those extreme lengths to avenge the kidnapping of his children. Number 3. Manuel Torres Felix Manuel Fidel Torres Felix, also known as LM1, was a notorious Mexican drug lord and a high-ranking leader of the Sinaloa cartel. When his son was killed by rival gang members of the Beltran Leva cartel, Torres Felix completely lost his mind and went on this violent rampage that spared no one. In the 1990s, Felix initially joined forces with the Sinaloa cartel. As fate would have it, he rose through those ranks and eventually would ascend to the apex of the cartel after his brother, Javier Torres Felix, was arrested in 2004. Under the guidance of Ismael Zambada Garcia, he began to work with Ovidio Guzman Lopez, the son of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, Mexico's former most wanted man, and he oversaw drug trafficking shipments coming out of South America into Mexico under the guidance of Ismael El Mayo Zambada. Now, during his reign, LM1 was caught up in a fierce rivalry with the Beltran Leva organization. It's worth noting that the Sinaloa cartel and the BLO were once allies, operating out of the same small state of Sinaloa. However, in 2008, the BLO broke away from this alliance, driven by one powerful force, greed. Both cartels wanted supreme dominance, and there was no other way than for one of them to go down. This rivalry eventually led to the most defining moment for LM1, causing his entire world to crumble and pushing him to the brink of madness. April 18th, 2008. Just outside the health ministry in the Montebello residential district of Cuyacan, a group of Sicarios working for the BLO ambushed LM1's 20-year-old son, Torres Acosta. Torres was ambushed along with his sister, Alondra, and LM1's sister-in-law, Riva Seredia. The Sicarios attempted to kidnap Torres Acosta, but he bravely resisted, prompting him to brutally shoot and kill him on the spot. The shots fired also injured his little sister, hitting her in the arm and shoulder, while his sister-in-law was wounded in her left leg. This incident flipped a switch in LM1's head. He went crazy and was out for revenge. A few days after the loss of his son, LM1 ordered his men to gather as many members of the BLO or Los Zetas and bring him to his ranch for torture. It was at this moment that LM1's true psychotic nature emerged. He subjected each man to unimaginable torture before coldly ending their lives. One of LM1's victims was the municipal police commander, Roberto Carlos Barcelo Villagran. LM1 had his back sliced to ribbons with knives, his legs cut off, and then beheaded while he was still alive. 
His body was then dumped with two others in the trunk of a car, while his Sicarios took the bodies of other victims and dumped them all around Kuyakan. Some might say an eye for an eye was enough, maybe even five deaths would be enough to satisfy LM1's thirst for revenge. Well, it wasn't. In fact, for every man he killed, he became more emotionally unstable. And as time would go on, this war between the BLO and the Sinaloa cartel would spiral out of control. The situation was getting worse with each passing day. LM1 earned himself the nickname El Ondeado, which means the crazy one, by torturing these men. He didn't stop at just a few. He would torture and kill over 30 different BLO Sicarios and ordered the killing of hundreds more. But despite his violent tendencies, LM1 was a cunning mastermind. He knew he was a wanted man, so he never left his hometown. He also made sure that the BLO Sicarios he killed were brought to his personal ranch. Now, During his killing spree, he even collaborated with El Mayo to control some of the Sinaloa cartel's affairs. However, the city of Cuyacan began to resemble a scene out of a horror movie. The streets were stained with blood and dead bodies could be found on almost every corner. In response, the Mexican government would deploy 2,000 troops to the city in an attempt to quell the violence. And eventually, they caught up with LM1. October 13, 2012, Torres Felix was killed in a gun battle in the community of Oso Viejo in Cuyacan, Sinaloa, finally putting an end to his reign of terror. Now, LM1 might have gone crazy after his son's murder, ensuring that no one was spared. This next person would make the same choice, but the distinction is that she was an ordinary person seeking justice, not vengeance. Number 2. Miriam Rodriguez Miss Rodriguez was consumed by one thing until the end of her life, justice. Her daughter Karen, just 20 years old, was abducted and killed by a Mexican cartel. The tragic events fueled Rodriguez's determination to hunt down every single one of her daughter's kidnappers. In her relentless pursuit of justice, Rodriguez went to great lengths. She changed her appearance, staked out the homes of these members, and spent countless hours digging through social media for any possible leads. Armed with a pistol, she often took matters into her own hands, chasing down her daughter's kidnappers on foot until the police arrived. But where did it all begin? January 23, 2014 was the day that changed everything for Miriam Elizabeth Rodriguez Martinez. While her daughter, Karen Alejandra Salinas Rodriguez, was driving through San Fernando, two trucks suddenly pulled up beside her. Then armed men forcefully entered her car and quickly drove away with her. Rodriguez and her family spent the following weeks desperately trying to bring Karen back home. They soon discovered that she had been taken by members of the notorious Zetas cartel, known for their ruthless kidnappings to fund their criminal operations. Karen's loved ones followed the cartel's instructions, hoping for her safe return. Bombarded with a barrage of phone calls, threats, and demands, they would take out a loan to pay Karen's ransom, leaving a bag of money at a designated drop-off point. However, their efforts were in vain, as Karen remained missing. With no other options left, Miriam made a daring move. She requested a meeting with a cartel member, and to her surprise, one agreed. Although he claimed he didn't know Karen's whereabouts, he offered to assist in the search for a fee of $2,000. Rodriguez paid that amount, but unfortunately, it led nowhere. She would learn one thing though, the person behind her daughter's abduction was named Sama. Armed with this crucial information, Rodriguez stumbled upon her first clue. She confided in her surviving daughter, expressing her belief that Karen had already been killed. However, she vowed to stop at nothing until she had tracked down the heartless individuals responsible. With meticulous deductive skills, Miriam began piecing together the puzzle surrounding her daughter's kidnappers. After finding Sama's account on Facebook, she managed to identify one of his acquaintances through their distinctive ice cream shop uniform. She would wait outside the store for hours until Sama finally showed up, and then she discreetly trailed him. Rodriguez managed to uncover Sama's place of residence, but she still required more information. In order to navigate his neighborhood undetected, she resorted to dyeing her hair red, 
donning this old uniform and engaging with his neighbors under the pretense of conducting a harmless poll. Not only that, but after being ignored by authorities for too long, Rodriguez finally found an ally within the federal police who was willing to help her. Later when interviewed, the police commander said, When she pulled her files onto the table, I had never seen anything like it. The details and information gathered by this woman working all alone were incredible. Although initially Sama managed to evade arrest, the police eventually apprehended him. Under pressure, Sama gave the police names of other cartel members, who shed even more light on Karen's abduction. One even agreed to take the police to the ranch where she had been killed. Now while at this ranch, Rodriguez stumbled upon some significant clues. Karen's scarf, a cushion from her truck, and even one of her femur bones. Determined to find her daughter's killers, she continued her relentless search. Ms. Rodriguez managed to track down and bring to justice a total of 10 cartel members who were involved in this kidnapping. Throughout her pursuit of justice, Rodriguez seemed to understand the risks involved, yet fearlessly pushed forward. She once said, I don't care if they kill me. I died the day they killed my daughter. I want to end this. I'm going to take out the people who hurt my daughter and they can do whatever they want to me. Tragically, her words would prove to be prophetic. March 2017, a group of 29 inmates managed to dig a tunnel and escape from a prison in Ciudad Victoria, where Karen's abductors had been imprisoned. Fearing for her safety, Miriam reached out to the authorities and requested police protection. The local police agreed to provide patrols to ensure her safety. However, two months later, on the same day Mexico celebrates Mother's Day, danger finally caught up with Rodriguez. The 57-year-old was hobbling up to her front door on crutches, as she had recently broken her foot while chasing after a suspect. It was then that this white Nissan, driven by the escaped inmates, would pull up in front of her house. Without warning, they would mercilessly shoot Rodriguez many times and quickly flee the scene. Her husband discovered her sprawled out into the driveway, clutching her purse where she kept her pistol. This brutal attack on Miriam Rodriguez enraged people across the state and prompted authorities to intensify their efforts to find her killers. While the government managed to apprehend two of the culprits, and one was killed in a gunfight, many others remained at large. Tragically in Mexico, Miss Rodriguez's story is hardly unique, but when her daughter became one of the countless innocent people abducted by the cartels, Miriam sprang into action and ensured justice was served for her daughter even if she had to pay for it with her life. Moving on to the next parent on this list, he was too determined to avenge his son's kidnapping. And although his case may be different as his child wasn't taken by a cartel, we believe it deserves an honorable mention. Number 1. Gary Ploche March 16, 1984. Gary was anxiously waiting at the airport. His son Jody had been kidnapped by a man named Jeff Doucet. But on that day, Gary was waiting at the airport for a different reason. To shoot down his son's kidnapper right in front of the cameras. Before all of this unfolded, Gary Ploche had led a pretty ordinary life. He'd served in the US Air Force for a short while and then worked as an equipment salesman even dabbled in camera work for a local news station. Just your average guy, trying to make a living. But then, everything took a dramatic turn. February 19th, 1984, something unimaginable happened to Jody Ploche, the innocent son of Gary. His karate instructor, Jeff Doucet, offered to take him for a quick ride. His mother, June, didn't think twice about it. After all, Doucet was a trusted member of their community and had been teaching karate to their kids for a while. Little did you know that Doucet had ulterior motives. Instead of just a short joyride, he took that boy all the way to the west coast. Along the way, Doucet decided to change their appearances. He would shave his beard and dye the boy's hair black, hoping to deceive anyone looking for him. They ended up in a rundown motel near Disneyland in Anaheim, California. But this was no fun-filled vacation. Inside that motel room, Jeff committed a heinous act. He assaulted this boy, his own student. This poor kid must have been very terrified. But despite that, Jody mustered up the courage to ask Jeff if he could call his parents. Surprisingly, Doucet allowed it. 
Well, Jody's parents wasted no time and immediately called the police. They traced that call and apprehended Doucet. Meanwhile, Jody was put on a flight back home to Louisiana, finally safe from his captor. Now, despite finding his son, Ploche couldn't shake off the rage he was feeling. He spent the next few days held up at a local bar called the Cotton Club, anxiously asking anyone he could find when Doucet would be brought back to Baton Rouge for trial. By sheer luck, a former WBRZ news colleague was there and informed Gary that Doucet would be flown in at 9.08 a.m. Gary wasted no time, heading straight to the Baton Rouge airport. Disguised with a baseball cap and sunglasses, he entered the arrivals hall, concealing his face. He noticed the WBRZ news crew preparing their cameras to capture the moment when Jeff Doucet would be escorted off the plane by a caravan of cops. As they passed by, Gary swiftly retrieved a gun hidden in his boot and fired a fatal shot in Jeff's head. The news crew was able to capture the chilling moment on camera, and the footage has now received over 20 million views on YouTube. In this video, we see Doucet suddenly collapsing while Barnett, a police officer, tackles Ploche against the wall. Amidst the chaos, Barnett, who happened to be friends with Ploche, demanded an explanation for his actions. Through tears, Ploche responded, If somebody did this to your kid, you do the same. Ploche was charged with second-degree murder, but he eventually reached a plea bargain and pled no contest to manslaughter. As a result, the court handed him a suspended sentence of seven years, along with five years of probation and 300 hours of community service. Even before completing his sentence, Ploche managed to slip back into a relatively normal life, staying under the radar. In 2014, Gary passed away in his 60s and is survived by his son, Jody. Jody wrote a book titled, Why Gary Why? and fondly remembers his father as someone who found the beauty in everything, a loyal friend who always brought laughter, and a hero to many.